Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the June 13th edition of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum and Humor Fest with staff. Um, now, Guys, we've got an interesting program today, and I'm looking forward to introducing it in just a second. Can you tell me how many of you get the newsletter we've been sending out every week? The email? Yeah, the email newsletter. <laughs> Great. I want to thank, I'm glad, and hopefully you're looking at it. Every now and then there's something in it worthwhile. I know because I usually put it together. But one of the things that I want to draw your attention to, and Frankly, I was going to do this before this past weekend, but now I really need to do this. Vision Action Network is an interesting organization in Washington County that serves as a catalyst for lots of interesting projects. They, along with the Sheriff's Office, the City of Beaverton, the Mayor's Office, and the Police Department, and the Washington County Council on Human Rights, have set up a very interesting evening. It's called Building a Community, Preventing Violence. And I have put that out in the newsletter a little bit. We have an interesting guest speaker. Vanessa Becker, the board chair of Umpqua Community College, will be talking for just a little bit. And the reason I say it is because it's an opportunity to hear somebody who's been through hell, yes, understood. But it's also an evening where we're trying to have the community come together as the beginning of a process to try and build enough strength in Washington County so that everyone who lives and works in Washington County can feel safe. Somehow that's got a stronger ring today than it would have if we were talking last Friday, but it has a strong ring nonetheless. It's at the Beaverton Community Center right across from the main library on 5th and Hall. And if you have a chance, I think it's 7 to 9, 7 p.m. to 9, if you have a chance, your involvement would be appreciated. This isn't just a Beaverton thing, it's located in Beaverton. This is a countywide thing with a lot of support. What it needs is it needs the people of Washington County. With that, today we are going to learn about the Family Justice Center in Washington County. Before I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, let me introduce a five-minute video which should introduce the topic a lot better than I can. So I get on the phone and I'm in tears and the nurse is like, listen, if you feel like you don't need to come in, that's fine. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, oh, so you need me to come in? And I'm crying. And she's like, no, but if you feel like you need to, you're more than welcome to. And I was like, oh, so you need me to be seen? And you could tell she was confused, right? But the reason why I did that is because I needed him to think I was expected somewhere. So I called back my doctor's office and I just simply told them, hey, I know I was acting weird on the phone. I'm in a lot of danger. He has a gun and my child's still in the house. And then they were like, oh my God, stay on the phone. And all I told them was, I'll keep the phone on, but I have to put it down. I have to run now. justice system, I know they get arrested, but that's as far as the officer can protect me. He'd be able to bail himself out, and I knew I had nowhere to go after that. One in four women has been a victim of domestic violence, so that's a quarter of our female population. Domestic violence calls are a unique animal in police work because they're very unpredictable. There are a number that I have been on in my life that I will always remember because of the nature of the violence. A survivor of intimate partner violence tries on average seven times to get out of a relationship. Even if they do seek help, even if they do call the police or their offender is taken away, they are left floundering to try to figure out what to do. Our current arrangement is that the survivor has to go to 5, 10, 15 different organizations to get all of the things that they need. Telling, retelling their story every single time, which is, you know, reliving their trauma every single time. You have low self-esteem, you're scared, you're scared for yourself, you're scared for your children, and you come in and they give you a form. You got yourself out, then they don't want to help you. 
Once we began to figure out how complicated it is for victims to get help, we realized that we had to figure out how we could put all the services under one roof. Just prosecuting the case wasn't solving all of her problems, and just prosecuting the case wasn't addressing the needs of the children in these complex family situations. They're bringing in survivors. They're listening to survivors because they have the information that we need. Just having a safe place to go immediately, to have someone who was like, I'm here and I'm going to walk through this process with you, that would have been really beneficial. The Family Justice Center brings professionals together under one roof to provide services to victims. It will allow police officers, prosecutors, advocates, doctors, therapists to be there. All these organizations will come together and form a steering committee which will bring the Family Justice Center to reality in Washington County. But this is only possible with your support. What we've seen across the nation is that when a Family Justice Center has been established, lethality goes down is really something long overdue for this county. The region is growing, more people are moving here from different problems, different situations, and it's really apparent that we're lacking this basic service. We need the community. This is a community issue. It's about community safety, public safety, individual safety. We need corporate partners to help sustain the Family Justice Center for the long run. And we need a facility of at least 20,000 square feet to house these various agencies. Please join us with your words, with your letters, with your dollars to help us make this become a reality. Domestic violence is a problem for everyone regardless of your background. We could all play a key role in helping solve it in our community. We want the community to feel comfortable when they come in and talk about these issues. With your support, we can build a place where survivors will find hope. They find healing and they find a pathway out of what they're experiencing. We all have a duty to bring a Family Justice Center to Washington County. Ladies and gentlemen of the forum, the project manager for the Washington County Justice Center, Patrick Lemon. Thank you very much. I believe that might be the most formal introduction I've ever been given. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for being here and for giving me an opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, Rob, you, sp you started by speaking about how violence has become much more immediate and immediately uh, present for us in the last 24, 48 hours. Uh, I appreciate your naming that. I think it's, it's critical that we understand the context in which we're operating, right? Violence exists in our culture in a wide variety of ways. Terrorism exists in our culture in a wide variety of ways. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what the Family Justice Center is about, a very particular kind of terrorism that we call domestic violence. And as you saw in the clip, we know that this affects a very wide uh, proportion of our population. Uh, the statistic that was given here was about a quarter of women experience domestic violence. The numbers I've seen are closer to half. So uh, it depends on the study that you look at, but if you want to be conservative, you say a quarter, so I think that's fair. Um, but we're talking about a very large part of our population. It's not only women, it is predominantly women, we know that, who experience violence. Uh, but everyone can and everyone, not everyone does, everyone can and everyone knows someone who has experienced violence, even if they haven't had uh, the space or the safety to be able to name that. Uh, in, uh, with you or to you specifically. So the idea behind a family justice center is, um, I'm hoping to go forward now. Me too. <laughs> we have a little technology challenge, but we'll get there in a moment, I'm sure. I have great faith in Eric, thank you. Um, but the idea behind a family justice center is that all of a survivor's needs can be present uh, and met at the same time in the same place. And so that's what we're talking about. It's under one roof. Uh, hmm. I'm trying to figure this out. 
And so whether that might be safety planning or counseling or police reports or um, support with uh, child support or uh, housing assistance or uh, counseling, I believe I may have already said, uh, transportation, employment services, even clothing, all of those things can become part of the struggle for a survivor to get out of or to get support in a situation of violence, right? Because each of those needs, particularly things like childcare or concern for children, can prevent someone from taking the steps they need for their safety, whether that's leaving or finding support for the abusive partner. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So this is what we're talking about, under one roof, right? The idea is there are so many different things that can prevent a survivor from getting the support they need. Um, if we can put them all in the same place, it greatly increases the likelihood that we'll be able to serve effectively that uh, survivor and get them what they need to move forward. So this is what we're talking about. The big, the big vision is we want a safe and welcoming place, not something that looks like a doctor's office or a police station or a courthouse, but something that's welcoming and familiar in some way, right? All the needs are met. The care is trauma-informed, which means we understand the ways that survivors often respond to traumatic situations. Children are protected. They have a place to go, to feel safe, and to play. Violence is not tolerated, won't happen within this center. There is security and safety. Aggressors are held accountable. And this is a rare thing that we hear, right? Because in addition to the Orlando uh, case that we've heard so much about recently, we have also heard about Stanford University, right? And the swimmer who was found guilty of sexual assault, but who was convicted, who was uh, sentenced to six months because the judge wanted to make sure that his life wasn't ruined. And I think it's valuable to pay attention to the idea of not ruining the lives of people who are offenders. I actually support that idea. And that's also, in this particular case, seems to be lacking accountability and lacking a recognition of the harm that's caused. So finding a way to address the harm that's caused is also part of this. We find ways to address economic justice, make sure that families are supported. And families have the ability to thrive, not just survive, right? I, I refer to victims as survivors, and I think that's important and valuable. And it's only the first step, right? We need to make sure that families are able to thrive. We break generational cycles, we restore hope, and that all of us work together, that we see this as a county-wide, state-wide, community-wide, however you see yourself, we see this as an issue that all of us play a part in resolving. So looking specifically at Washington County, these are, as you can see, the police reports for 2014 and 15 for domestic violence. It happens in every community. Um, you can see, obviously, Beaverton and Hillsborough have the largest uh, number of assaults, but they do not have the largest proportion. This happens in cities and in suburbs and in rural areas. We know it happens everywhere. And that's the key that we need to recognize. It does happen everywhere. And having said that, we also know it's only scratching the surface. Clackamas County opened their um, Family Justice Center at the end of 2013. They've already seen more than a doubling of the number of domestic violence reports filed. So more than double in l less than three years. And, those, and by the way, that's a year old statistic, so it's probably more than that now. It may well be double that again. Uh, because I was just there a couple of weeks ago, and they are already, have, again, having opened at the end of 2013, they're busting at the seams. They have more demand, both among agencies that want to help and among survivors, than they possibly have space for. So they're working on it. 
But in Washington County, what we know is that since 2000, there were 125 homicides. 31 of those were directly homicides by partners or former partners of the, of the victim. And an additional 22 were people who died in family violence. So that might be bystanders or children or something of that sort. So that means more than a third of survivors I'm sorry, more than a third of homicide victims are directly connected to domestic violence. And I see a gentleman has a, a question. Since 2000, there have been 125 homicides. This again is, is about a year old statistic because we don't have the most recent data. 125 in Washington County. And so again, more than a third of those were directly related to domestic violence. We also know that the cost of a homicide prosecution is between one and one and a half million dollars. And then lifetime incarceration is another million dollars on top of that. So this is in addition to being an unacceptable level of violence, it's also quite expensive for our communities. And if we can find ways to address that, we can get a lot farther and not to be crass, but and save money as a community, which is something we're all looking for, right? So I talked earlier, and you heard in the film, the idea that it can be daunting to figure out how to reach all of the different services that you might be able to get, right? You have to go from place to place, moving around. Imagine if you don't have a car, or if you have children who have to come with you, or if you have a job and you're taking time off of work, if you have to go to all of these different places, sometimes as literally as many as 10 or 15 places, and schedule appointments and make all of these different things, if you do that, it often becomes impossible, right? And so at a certain point, you decide, it's better for me to stay and take my chances. Hopefully, I'll be able to survive that. And that's a struggle not only in Washington County, it's a struggle everywhere. And that's why our friends at the Alliance for Hope International, and this is them, it's Casey and Gail in the back, they are the founders of this project. They're in San Diego, and they understood that if we found ways to make that path simpler and more straightforward, if we served survivors rather than survivors serving our needs, we would be much more effective. And so that's what we're trying to do. So we did a study here in Washington County. Key findings, what are, we, what are we looking for, right? And what we know is that this is true, some of these are specific to uh, Washington County and some are national, right? So with family justice centers, victims are more likely to remove themselves from the abusive situation that they're in. If that's what they want to do, they're more likely to do it with a family justice center model than with the traditional model with, that we've had to this point. They're also more likely to show up for trial uh, and uh, testify at trial. They're also more likely to seek diversion, again, if that's what they're looking for. And diversion is alternatives to traditional criminal justice models, right? It's a way of, again, reducing cost and reducing recidivism rates. We also know that lethality diminishes. We obviously don't have any information about that for Washington County because we don't, ex we don't exist yet as a center. We're working towards that. But what we know is that nationally, their domestic, uh, family justice centers have had as much as a 50% reduction in DV homicides. And so that's an enormous statement of success, right? And by the way, that's on top of the research that's been done that between the 1970s when domestic violence shelters were first opened and the early 1990s, we saw a 30% reduction in uh, DV homicides when that happened. This is on top of that, that DV homicides are going down very quickly. But part of why we know this can work here is that we in Washington County have a history of working together. The Domestic Violence Intervention Council is very strong here. It's done a lot of work. They're very much in support of this. The Domestic Violence Resource Center, which is the primary agency for domestic violence survivors in Washington County, uh, is quite strong and adept at working with a broad range of organizations. Sorry, I'm a little hoarse, I'm getting over a cold, I'm almost there. 
And what we know is that we have also models in Multnomah County and Clackamas County. They've done this so far and we are catching up to their very good work, right? We have models to build on and opportunities to really uh, build a regional effort and a regional project. We also have a lot of support, not just in the nonprofit sector, but law enforcement. We have uh, the Hillsborough Police uh, Chief, we have Forest Grove's Police Chief, we have the Sheriff, who are very actively involved, uh, Beaverton's Police Chief, um, <clears throat> Tiger Dwellett, and you see this list here. Um, we have the First Lady of Beaverton, and also now the First Lady of Hillsborough supporting us, the Washington County DA, uh, many advocates, they work together. We've been doing some planning and, uh, and working towards getting the space, getting the word out, helping people to see that we're out here, that we're getting ready to make this happen. Now we need a building, right? If we build it, they will come is the theory, and that's what we're working toward. But we're not there yet, right? We need to raise the money, but part of the, uh, the biggest part of the money is going to be for a building. It's probably gonna need to be about 25,000 square feet is what we're learning. Um, <clears throat> we want it to be as easily accessible as possible. Near a max line would be ideal, but it's not the only option, of course. And we want it to be accessible throughout the county. So we've been having some interesting discussions between particularly Hillsborough and Beaverton, you know, which one are we gonna hold it in? And we're not sure yet is the short answer. It might not be either. We might do it in central Washington County, in Aloha, something like that. We'll figure it out. Um, but we have a large team working together. This is just a small part of it actually showing up here. Uh, what we did is we had a two-day strategic planning session uh, almost a year ago now. And uh, the, these are the people who lasted the entire two days, which was quite a commitment and a lot of fun. Um, but what we still need is we need everyone. We need you to join us. And what that means is we need you to start talking about this, right? Talk about it with your friends. Talk about it with your colleagues. Uh, thank you again for inviting me to be here to have the conversation with you or to start the conversation. But it won't succeed if this is the end, right? We need to keep talking about it, recognize the value and importance and the number of opportunities we have to make a change and create a better and safer and healthier Washington County. This is my contact information. I'm here to talk as much as you all want. Any questions or comments you have? And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Lemon. People who have questions can line up on the right if they are paid. And while people are, because only paid up members of the forum have the privilege to ask our speaker questions. And we told him that before he came and he insisted that nobody who wasn't a paid up member would ask a question and we thanked him very much for that. I would also make the point that anybody buying a membership now will be buying it for next year. You'll get your, mem your mem members will get your renewal notice fairly soon over the summer because the forum year is September through June. As a matter of fact, this is our second last forum for the current season. Okay, folks, we've got some people lined up. Let's go for questions. Thank you. Um, Jim Cape, for member. It seemed kind of funny that in the video you had that Tanya Richardson who had gotten in trouble for yes. intimidation, harassment, and mm -hmm. stalking. But the main concern is that you talk about needing money, but <clears throat> the money's already being spent. I mean, the county district attorney has several employees working on this. Mm -hmm. The county sheriff's department has several employees working on this. The five-member county commission has oversight on this. Mm -hmm. The 17 or so county judges have partial oversight on this. Many of the cities have several employees involved in this. The State Department of Justice has several employees who are supposed to be doing this. The Federal Department of Justice has several employees who are supposed to be doing this. So instead of doing a sob story about what isn't being done, it's already being paid for, so you should be naming names of who isn't doing their paid job. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. I, uh, I appreciate the perspective. You might not be surprised that I don't entirely share your perspective, but I understand where you're coming from. 
Um, and part of what I said, and I, I was very intentional, you're right, a lot of money is spent not on the Family Justice Center, but on the issue of domestic violence. Is that a fair, is that what you were talking about? The whole issue is already being paid for. Okay, right. The issue of domestic violence, as w all other forms of violence, right, is already being paid for in lots of ways. And I agree with you that the Family Justice Center ultimately will, if prior history is any indicator, in fact, save the county money, save the state money, and save the federal government money. But that's going to take a little while because ramp up costs and, and short term duplication of services while we're recreating this model. This is what it looks like to reframe or rethink how we're going to address an issue, right? I think that's part of the struggle. I also want to acknowledge uh, what you said in the beginning of your question. Um, I'm not sure I would have used the word funny, but a little bit awkward, we do have, um, we did have a challenge. The first person who was in my role as the project manager, Tanya Richards, was in fact arrested for, uh, I believe the words you used were intimidation, which I think is, is what she was ultimately, what she ultimately pled guilty to. Um, she was part of the Family Justice Center effort. She put a lot of energy and time, and I acknowledge and appreciate the work that she did. She also had personal issues that she has needed to address. Um, she's addressing them. She's not part of the Family Justice Center any longer, uh, but we feel that the issue is too important to leave behind because of the unfortunate uh, situation that one person found herself in. But I appreciate your naming it. I think it's important to be upfront. Uh, my name is Bill Kroger. I'm a former member. Thanks for coming in, and I wish you good luck on your project. Thank you. You know, a lot of people, in, including myself, think there's too many people in the world. Uh, yes, but you, for some reason, I just never hear anything about population control or anymore or anything like that. And I was just wondering if you guys ever discuss it or if you hear anything about that. About population control, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I hear a little bit of conversation about that. I, um, I was a sociology student in grad school, and we talked about Malthusian economics, right? This is the idea that our population is too large, and at a certain point, we need to reduce the population. That's not part of this work. What we're interested in is ensuring that survivors of domestic violence gain control over their lives again. And, and one of the very interesting things that we know and that we're learning more and more about domestic violence is the concept of reproductive coercion. And this is one of the controlling behaviors of abusers is often track, forcing their partners to become pregnant or to impregnate them on, on the unusual but existing occasions when it's a woman abusing a man, uh, controlling uh, sabotaging birth control, doing other things of that sort that prevent uh, a person from their own bodily integrity, right? And one of the key components of bodily integrity is choosing when and how many children to have. So that's a component of this, is ensuring that that opportunity, that that option is within the choice of a person themselves. Uh, but it's a little bit different, and, and we don't take a stand on uh, what size any family should be, for example. I think that it, what we're trying to do is reinforce the um, safety of an individual to make those choices themselves. Thank you. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, Ford member. Thank you for coming today. I have a question about uh, prevention, and I wonder, do you have a component in your program or some aspect of your program that deals with uh, what could be done to stop this from occurring? Thank you. I, I really appreciate any questions about prevention. I'm actually a preventionist at heart. Um, when I lived in Washington, D.C., which is where I was until six years ago when I moved to Portland, um, is I ran an organization called Men Can Stop Rape, which is explicitly about men ending gendered violence. I think it's a critical component of any conversation that the, the best way to end violence is to stop it from ever happening in the first place, as you said. Uh, and we are talking about that as a component of this Family Justice Center. It's not standard as part of the model nationally, but I think it's 
re absolutely essential and a great opportunity. I was talking earlier about Multnomah County and Clackamas County having their own family justice centers. This would be a great issue for us to work together on because prevention is necessarily collaborative and cross communities. And so I think that we'd be able to find a way to enhance prevention efforts that already exist uh, by joining forces with the other centers. So thank you very much for that. Chris Leslie, forum member. Yes, sir. Appreciate you being here. I'm wondering about numbers, mm -hmm. about uh, percentages of men versus women, uh, religious groups, mm -hmm. types of uh, groups that you identify as having the biggest problems, maybe Republicans mm -hmm. versus Democrats. <laughs> wow. Okay. I gotta, you know, get everything in there. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I'm assuming you're talking about percentages in terms of perpetration or victimization, is that? And age groups. And age groups, okay. So here's what I know. And the numbers I have are national, not local. So to be clear, it's conceivable, although unlikely, that Washington County is different uh, in this way. Um, but the numbers I've seen, as I said, are between a third and a half of women experience domestic violence and about five to 10% of men. So start with that division. And, uh, and then when we talk about the proportion the proportion of perpetration, about 85% of domestic violence is perpetrated by men and about 15% by women, seems to be a fairly consistent number nationally. There is a little bit of data that, uh, that questions that, but um, in part, th that data doesn't look as closely at things as uh, such as mutual abuse or defensive aggression, if that, that's an unusual term. But the idea that someone who is, in fact, the primary victim will sometimes lash out uh, later in the process, and then they get arrested because the perpetrator, the controlling person, steps in and, and tries to make himself, usually the man, look like the victim. Uh, what we also know is that domestic violence tends to be among uh, tends to be much heavier among younger people. So ages 18 to 35 are, are by far the largest age group in which it takes place. And a big part of that, I think, is that relationships that include domestic violence often don't last terribly long. And so uh, older men don't have, uh, or older people don't have the opportunity or the risk for domestic violence to be occurring as much. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And then when we get into significantly older people, over 60 or even older, over 70, we start seeing elder abuse, which is a different kind of domestic violence and is uh, becoming more and more, uh, we are becoming more and more aware of it and understanding some of those dynamics. I don't know any data about religious uh, religious distinctions in terms of perpetration or victimization. Um, uh, Same-sex relationships appear to have about the same level as uh, mixed gender relationships, which is surprising to a lot of people, but that the data is pretty clear on that. And I know nothing about Republicans versus Democrats. <laughs> like, let me see if I can get all of the pieces you ask. Thank you very much. Hi, Tim Hutchinson, forum Hello. member. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm interested in, you know, since the time is usually a critical element and, you know, a lot of these things turn out to be like crises for these people. That's right. Um, how do you, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you're going to interface with the, you know, the actual shelters that are mm -hmm. the kind of safe haven and sure. so, so kind of take us through what would happen? I mean, would you be the point people or? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the main shelter in Washington County is called Monica's House, and it's run by the Domestic Violence Resource Center, which will be the anchor agency at the Family Justice Center. So we would be very closely connected with the shelter. Um, the shelters in the Tri-County area also share uh, information with one another. So if there's an open bed in Clackamas County and not at Monica's house, then the person will go to Clackamas County and we, we do that kind of exchange regularly. Please. But do they, uh, but I mean, 
know, these women are slash men, whoever mm -hmm. is the big, uh, what, what was your, their initial contact? Did they call uh. you? I got gotcha. you. Okay, so the the question, so because it's not mic'd, so I want to make sure that it's uh, caught on the video, and I got a thumbs up from the videographer. Happy to help. Uh, the question was, so what's a person's first point of contact? And uh, there are lots of options. They might call the police first. They might call uh, a housing agency. I was talking to someone uh, during lunch earlier. Uh, that more than 70% of child welfare cases, so if a child welfare call comes in, involve domestic violence. So it might be from a child welfare case. It might be a neighbor. The first contact can look like a lot of different things. There are hotline numbers uh, that people can call. Uh, DVRC has a hotline number. There's a national hotline number. So people can make contacts in a variety of different ways. The key is that what we want to do is let them know what their options are. So when the first person makes contact, a wide variety of options is open to them. And so the first thing we do is make sure that they're safe in, the, in this moment. Are you in at immediate risk, right? And then we'll figure out what that means. And by the way, that's defined differently by different people, right? So are you in immediate risk? We're gonna make sure to manage that. And then we'll start talking about options. What do you need in order to make the best decision for you? Whether that's going to shelter, which is true for about 10% or less of people who call for services around domestic violence, or something else. They need counseling. They want uh, a referral uh, for their abusive partner to get support. They want a restraining order. They want whatever it is that they need uh, that we'll know how to get them to the place that they need to be. Is that fair? Thanks. Um, again, thank you for being out here. Uh, Jaime Rodriguez, board member. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, first of all, just a question. You said 25,000 square feet? I probably so yes sir we might start smaller and that's fine too but we're what we know from both Multnomah and Clackamas counties is that they're they wish they had 25,000 feet now okay so my question is really is that regarding um Washington County and its many demographics large demographics of ethnicities yes, and cultures mm -hmm. and then there's some cultures you know Latino cultures Asian cultures whatever the culture may be were um, generational and culturally accepted Domestic violence? Yes, sir. Fear? Mm -hmm. How are you guys going to plan on, on reaching out to those um, communities also? Well, thank you very much for naming that. And we are working with several different culturally specific groups as part of this. Adelante Mujeres is going to be part of it. Uh, El Programa Hispana uh, Catholico, which used to be part of Catholic Charities, but they're in the process of doing a, a reorganization, uh, is part of this. Uh, Sawera, which is for South Asian uh, survivors, has actually just merged with the Domestic Violence Resource Center, but they're still very much a part of it. Uh, and there are a few other cultural, culturally specific communities. So we are making absolutely sure that that's part of the experience and that, um, and that there will be space for culturally specific groups uh, in the Family Justice Center. So when I say helping people to be aware of a wide variety of options, that can be for a culturally specific or, by the way, religiously specific group. There's an organization called ARMS, which stands for Abuse Recovery Ministry Services. And they do really great faith-based work. And they're also planning to be part of the Family Justice Center here. So a wide variety of options is exactly what we're looking for. We want people to feel safe, again, whatever that means to them. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, hi, John Tyner, Forum Mentor. Patrick, um, I just wanted to work some of the statistics. Um, Washington County has about nine homicides a year. Yes, sir. And, and it's been pretty consistent over the last uh, 18 uh, years. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I think you said there's almost 250 prosecutions for domestic violence in this uh, county. Is that right? Is that the state? What was, the, what was the number that you said? There were, I'm going to pull out the statistics. I don't know them by heart. <laughs> there were about uh, 6,000 calls for DV in 2014 and 15. I, I don't actually know the number of prosecutions. Oh, let's say that there were 250 in a year. Okay. Uh, let's just assume that the DA's office filed about 250. Okay. Um, and this is a county of um, half a million of whom um, 
let's just assume 250,000 are women. Okay. And assume a 50 year, uh, if, if you take it from 15 to 65. So would you assume that based upon the, that, that component, um, there'd be 2,500 to 3,000 3, um, women subject to domestic violence in any given year, assuming that the, that the balloon for those things is the age of 15 to 35? Well, um, domestic violence tends to be fairly long lasting, so pro it's probably higher than that because each person's experience of domestic okay. violence typically will last several years. Okay, so you'd have to aggregate that. That's how you get to the 6,000 complaints in a two or three year period of time? Exactly. Okay. Right, and that, it's 6,000 each year, by the way, just to be clear. 6,000 each year, okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. It's like I don't have a calculator with me. I appreciate that. Hi, so I'm Karen Bolin. Hello. I wondered if you might share with the audience um, your how long you've been in your role and kind of what your vision is going forward and how either citizens or businesses or community members might support you in your Excellent. role. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been in my role specifically for about four months now, so relatively new, but I've been working on this project in Washington County for two years. So I've been around almost since the beginning. Uh, I took on this role when, as we talked about earlier, Tanya Richards uh, needed to step down. So I'm here and uh, helping to keep things moving forward. Our goal is to have a center open and operating within a year. So by early summer of next year, we expect to have the center uh, open and operating. And at that point, if not before, I will step back. I think it's important that that center uh, be run by a new person. I think I'm going to go out and make some enemies. I'm going to go out and uh, cause some trouble. That's, you know, organizing anything creates difficulty. I think it'll be the best thing to have a new person step in when the building is new. So that that's the plan for me specifically. We're looking at the center, uh, as I said, to be opening, say, June or July of next year. And, uh, and what we're looking for is statements of support at this point. Of course, money is always helpful and is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous help in moving things forward. Uh, the county has already said, see if I can get this exactly right, that we will be at the table when money issues are discussed. They have not committed to a specific dollar amount, but they are committed to being part of this. They recognize it as part of the county's responsibility. Uh, and so what we're asking for from individuals and from businesses, as you said, is to help us to keep the conversation going, to help us make important connections, uh, to, uh, if we're missing anything, please hold us accountable. If we're, if we're making mistakes, let us know. If we're leaving out an important voice, I may raise the question of culturally specific groups, which I so appreciate. Uh, that's part of the process. We need to figure that out. And we're gonna do that together. Good, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, I had actually two questions. Okay. The I think that's allowed. Do you need to do you I need to Kate double Arnold. member? Yeah. I'm she has to go to the end of the line, but I think she's already <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kate Arnold and I'm a member of the forum. My Wonderful. first question is, do you have any um, background information about how often abusers actually come from backgrounds of abuse? Um, I have I have some information on that. It's something I'm very cautious with because what people what people often say accurately is that most abusers were abused, and that that's true. Can't deny that, and I think it's very meaningful. And it also speaks to the value of prevention because if we can stop violence, we stop the generational cycle of violence. The difficulty with that is that often people hear that as if I've been abused, I'm already fated to be abusive, mm -hmm. that I have no choice. So although most abusers were abused, the overwhelming majority of people who were abused do not grow up to become abusers. So it's really important to say that very carefully. Is that fair and reasonable? Um, yeah, I just wonder why the statistics continue to stay, I mean, a quarter to a half is, that's, mm -hmm. those are, that's, is that both mental and physical abuse? 
Uh, that is people who make, uh, who define their experience as domestic violence in some way. So it can include mental, physical, emotional, economic, sexual, uh, and on down the line, all of the different forms of abuse. Um, but it tends to tilt heavily towards people who experience physical abuse because that's what our culture tends to define as uh, domestic violence. Which makes it even worse. Exactly. So it's probably higher numbers than that in reality. Yeah. Exactly. And how often are kids abused as well? And what are the protections? I mean, like the mm -hmm. big one, one of the, the biggest problems is someone who's abused will often drop the charges. If a child's abused, is there a higher standard? Wow. Um, well, I'm not with law enforcement, so I want to be careful <laughs> about uh, speaking for them. But what one of the things we know is that um, the correlation between child abuse and domestic violence is extremely high, that it's almost one to one. If one is happening and there are children in the home, then the other is almost always also happening. So uh, the connection's very strong. And even if not, the experience of witnessing abuse is identified as a form of trauma. And so even if a child is not being directly abused themselves, the fact that their parent ha is being abused uh, is deeply impactful for children's lives. Um, so I think that um, we try very hard to keep the decision about how to move forward with the survivor so that the survivor can figure out what makes the most sense and how they can, op how they can continue to live their lives uh, in health and safety. Thank is you. that fair? Okay, hmm? thank you. Thank thank you. Chris Appreciate Leslie the again. challenging questions, please. Uh, the idea of um, tax deductions, you never mentioned that. Are people eligible if they donate? Yes, we are, thank you. We are a 501c3 a nonprofit organization, so all, all uh, donations to the organization are specifically tax deductible. Thank you. And a follow up. Yes, sir. How do you um, account for substance abuse in a lot of this domestic violence? Uh, another one of those really interesting, challenging questions. Substance abuse has a very high correlation with domestic violence, but I don't want to come anywhere close to saying that substance abuse explains it. Often what happens is that people use substances in order to low their in lower their inhibitions to give themselves permission to engage in behavior that they would want to behave in, uh, that they would want to engage in anyway. And so it's an, it's a, it's a kind of self-permission to be abusive when people take substances. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mike, <clears throat> apparently your cold's going around quickly. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, Mike Holcomb, form member. Uh, I want to get back to this building. You're yes, talking 25,000 square feet, so therefore we're talking roughly, what, about a $2.5 million building? Three stories, um, four have, stories. Haven't done all of the all of the research on it, but yeah, it's it's looking like something in that direction potentially. Okay, and then pulling all the agencies into it. Mm -hmm. Are when the agencies come into it, does this mean such places as the employment office down in down, downtown Hillsboro is that going to move to it, or is it just going to be another office that's opening up? And who will all these? Because you're talking about a lot of. Um, private agencies, private yes, sir. things coming into it, mm -hmm. but also a lot of public agencies coming into it. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be the overall run and own this building? Family, you know, domestic Family violence, justice center. Recent, you know, <laughs> justice center, is it going to be, or is it going to become part of a county? <laughs> uh, you, know, it's a, you know, something under the county for, you know, situation, yeah. and therefore a new building that they're going to be responsible for paying for and maintaining and, so and, on and so all forth. of those components those yes sir well uh, we are in discussions about a wide variety of possibilities right we want to leave open uh, we want to leave ourselves open to what 
comes available. Uh, we're unlikely, frankly, to build our own building. We're likely to uh, use a building that exists. If the county were to come to us, for example, and say, hey, we have this building that's available and it meets the criteria for what you need and we're, let, we're willing to let you move into it and that'll be our contribution, I think our response would be yippee. Right, you know that. So we don't want to say we're going to get our own building. It's we're open to options. We're just starting to look at that right now. Uh, it's part of the process moving forward. Um, so that's still somewhat up in the air. But you're right. The expenses could ultimately be pretty high. Uh, but the other piece of that. Uh, that you asked about is whether services would be moved from one location into the Family Justice Center. Our goal is not, actually. Our goal is that it would be an expansion of available services. So if there's a location for housing services uh, in one place, we wouldn't want to remove that and put it in the Family Justice Center. Ideally, what we'd want to do is have more services available, if that makes sense. So that would stay there and we'd have another spot here. Um, so that's, again though, it, it's we need to talk about that and figure that out. For small organizations, that might not be possible, in which case they might choose to entirely relocate and we'll support that if that's best for everybody. But what we're talking about in terms of our budget, again, it's nothing's finalized, but we're starting to sketch it out, is we're probably talking about six to $700,000 a year for the Family Justice Center uh, it, itself. And that is the organization that would run the building or run the space, uh, and then it would have a lot of tenants being all of the different people, the partners that we've spoken of. Thanks. Last question. Hi, Spencer Ehrman, forum member. Hi. Um, timing is critical, um, the sooner the better. Yes, sir. Um, Washington County is a very diverse uh, county geographically, it sprawls. Yes. Um, might it not make sense to uh, some in, take some interim steps by partnering with some existing agencies such mm -hmm. as LifeWorks or Community Action, mm -hmm. um, organizations that already have um, geographically diverse facilities? Mm -hmm. and use a space there as a way to set up centers. Hmm. Uh, what, you know, Tigard, Wilsonville, right. you know, wherever, mm -hmm. out here. Right. So. Well, thank you for that. And the, all of the partners that we've talked about who are part of the Family Justice Center effort are already providing services, and so, and they're located fairly dispersed across the county. And so what we're doing is, uh, or what we're seeing already is that organizations are doing more collaboration and working together today than they were two years ago because of the experience of the Family Justice Center. And so I think we're, we're doing that kind of on an informal basis now uh, because we're, we're at the moment keeping our costs very low uh, by managing it that way. And the idea is when we get to the the you know the opening point uh, will be able to do a lot more, and we're also talking about how we can, you know, assume for a moment that we're going to be in Beaverton, which is one of our options. If we're in Beaverton, how we'll be able to serve the rest of the county, uh, and we've talked about a wide variety of different possibilities. I mean, from things as kind of out there as having a. I remember growing up the bookmobile. Right, that we would have the family justice mobile. It would be a large uh, mobile center that could move around the county and be in different places to ensure that no one center is, uh, or no one location is underserved or is dramatically underserved. Uh, another option is that, as I said, the existing agencies that are already fairly widespread is that we might be able to map where they are put the Family Justice Center where they are not, and then if those centers stay, if the other agencies stay open, then people could have an initial point of contact uh, at either the Family Justice Center or any one of the agencies. Thank you, thank you. And thanks everyone for your challenging questions and interesting comments. Actually, 
There are always challenging questions. These people here are absolutely amazing. It's also interesting to see how well you handled them, sir. Thank you very, very much for being here. And we'll probably bring you back for a progress report sometime down the road. Anytime. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Lemon, Project Director for the Washington County Family Justice Center. And next week, we're going to have our last, for the, our last program for the season. We have Dr. James Moore from Pacific University telling us just what happened in the primary election, because I'm not sure. And <laughs> And also what's going to happen in the November election, and I'm not sure I want to know that one, but he will be here nonetheless. We'll have our annual meeting. We'll see you at 1155 next week for the board. We have a board meeting over at this table in about five minutes. Thank you so much. See you next week. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.